Good morning, everyone. Let's all stand and begin our worship together. Yes. I was talking to her. She said she wanted to. They will. people that have gone out of town for Thanksgiving and they're not back as you can <laughs> as you can see <laughs> uh, this happens every year well listen we're going to have a great Christmas Eve service here in a few weeks so we hope you'll all take note of that uh, on Christmas Eve we're going to have the choir's going to do a Christmas musical and They've been practicing, and it's, uh, it's going to be a great performance, a great uh, witness for Christ. And then we're going to do communion. We're going to have lighting some candles. So we're going to have a good time on Christmas Eve. And if you read my newsletter, you know that the session decided not to have services on Christmas Day, which is a Sunday, and uh, just let people celebrate Christmas in their homes with their families and not have to get dressed and come to church. So uh, get dressed anyway, but you don't have to. <laughs> uh, I'm not suggesting that you not get dressed. I'm just suggesting that you don't have to dress up and come to church. It's just, we're just going to give you a day off that Sunday. Oh, boy, I could get in trouble with stuff like that. <laughs> okay. Uh, just to make you happy here, I want to... I wanna, I have a, uh, oh, there it is. I have a recipe I'd like to share with you. Um, and it's a, actually it's rules for Christmas cookies. How many of you like cookies? Okay. Christmas cookie rules. Number one, if you eat a Christmas cookie fresh out of the oven, it has no calories because everyone knows that the first cookie is just the test, and so it's calorie-free. Okay? Amen. Number two, if you drink a diet soda after eating your second cookie, it also has no calories because the diet soda cancels out the cookie calories. Amen to that. Number three, if a friend comes over while you're making your Christmas cookies and needs to sample, you must sample with your friend because your friend's first cookie is calories free. You gotta look back at number one. And uh, yours is also. It would be rude to let your friend sample alone and being the friend that you are, that makes your cookie calorie free. Number four, any cookie calories consumed while walking around will fall to your feet and eventually fall off as you move. This is due to gravity and the density of the caloric mass. I like that one. Okay, I'll have some more for you next week. And uh, I just wanted, to set your, just wanted to set your mind at ease and let you know you can have all the Christmas cookies you want. And you can even make Christmas cookies and bring them up here. And... Uh, <laughs> we will help you get rid of them. Yeah, because you share them. Okay. All. <laughs> now, yeah, bring them 
Does anyone? Yeah. <laughs> Does anyone? <laughs> Deborah said what? Bring them warm. Yeah, bring them warm <laughs> right out of the oven would be better. Okay. Matter of fact, there's some donuts back here. I think they're left over from Wednesday's Bible study. No. And uh, <laughs> they, they feel kind of heavy. Oh, they're from yesterday. <laughs> All right. Let's, uh, at this time, uh, since we're in Advent, we're going to have our Advent wreath service. The first candle of Advent is the candle of hope. Today, we recall the hope we have in Christ. The prophets of Israel all spoke of the coming of Christ and of how a savior would be born in the line, the king in the line of David. They spoke of how he would rule the world wisely and bless all nations. As followers of Christ, we await his return. We light this candle, the candle of hope, to remember that he came to us humbly in the manger at Bethlehem and gave light to the world. So he is coming again in power to deliver his people. We light this candle to remind us to be alert and to watch for his return. Let us pray. Loving God, we thank you for the promise of the Messiah who came to be the light of the world. Help us prepare our hearts to receive him. Bless our worship. Help us to hear and do your word. And we ask it in the name of the one born in Bethlehem. Amen. Let's continue our worship as we prepare for worship today. Take just a few moments and bow. Pray and uh, make your uh, make your request known to God, and we'll be uh, we'll continue in just a moment. Lord, sometimes when we come to your house, we're overwhelmed by what we experience. But because of what you have done for us in Christ, we rejoice as the doors of the sanctuary are opened, loving hearts welcome us, and your life-giving word is read, sung, and proclaimed. It is truly good to be in the house of the Lord. We thank you that on this first Sunday in Advent, we of all people should have the greatest hope. And we ask that you would make this hour truly a celebration of the coming of eternal light to shatter the darkness and bring new life to all. We pray this morning in the name of our Lord Jesus, who is our blessed hope. Amen. Let's all stand, continue worshiping as we sing together our hymns of hope.
to share our affirmation of faith to get hope has come let the people rejoice bring songs of praise to worship the savior who has come to earth come with shouts of joy to honor the god who took on flesh lift up your voices to the king who forever reigns on high hope has come let the people rejoice a savior, a savior has, has been, been born, born to us. us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Be seated, please. <coughs> As we go to the Lord in prayer in a few moments, we want to remember all those on our prayer concerns list. We have uh, a number of people on there. Uh, that we really need to continue to pray for. Okay. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer at this time. Loving God, as we enter into this Advent season, help us, Lord, to remember what is truly important in our lives. In his last lecture, Jesus instructed us to be on guard and to be alert. Yet we have become rather complacent. And we often forget these admonitions to be aware. Keep our eyes open to your arrival. And inspire us to live as if each day were our last day. Let our focus be on preparing our hearts and homes for your coming. Not on the frenzy of shopping and decorating. I'm always amazed, Lord. It seems like we start our Christmas preparations that are really very, uh, very domestic, very common. And yet we start those earlier every year. I was amazed a week or so ago that my neighbor was out, of, out putting Christmas lights up on his house. And this was like a week before Thanksgiving. And I think to myself, Lord, I don't understand the rush. We should be in that mode all year. So Father, help us to focus our attention not on decorations, but on caring for each other. And help us to be mindful of those who enter this season, not with a sense of gladness, but with grief, or wistfulness. Father, we lift up in particular this morning those who are ill, those who mourn the loss of a loved one who struggled to make peace with painful memories of past Christmas seasons. Lord, we would remember those on our prayer concerns list and especially those who minister to their needs each day. Lord, may their hope be in you and the promise of your return. We pray this prayer in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. If our ushers have come forward, if we could find some ushers. If our ushers have come forward, we'll receive our morning offering at this time.
singen. Thank you, choir. Just one more. I can't help myself. Any calories consumed during the frosting of the Christmas cookies will be used up because it takes many calories to lick excess frosting from a knife without cutting your tongue. Cookies colored red or green have very few calories. Red ones have three. Green ones have five. One calorie for each letter. So the trick is to make more red ones. 
Oh, me. That's enough of that stuff. Oh, me. The Advent season is here. And the first Sunday of Advent, as you know, is hope, the Hope Sunday. I want to share with you today some thoughts on expectations, some thoughts on hope. And I want you to look with me at Luke chapter 1. We're going to be reading verses 8 through 22. Luke chapter 1. Once when Zechariah's division was on duty and he was serving as priest before God, he was chosen by lot, according to the custom of the priesthood, to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And when the time for the burning of incense came, all the assembled worshipers were praying outside. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. And Zachar when Zechariah saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you are to call him John. He will be a joy and delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he is born. He will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God. And he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to make, to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous. To make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Zechariah asked the angel, how can I be sure of this? I am an old man and my wife is well along in years. The angel said to him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God and I have been sent to speak to you and to tell you this good news. And now you will be silent and not able to speak until the day this happens because you did not believe my words, which will come true at their appointed time. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah and wondering why he stayed so long in the temple. When he came out, he could not speak to them. And they realized he had seen a vision in the temple. But he kept making signs to them, but remained unable to speak. Now I want you to uh, go with me. Let's turn over to verse 70, 76 of chapter 1. And we read these words. And you, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High. For you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him. To give his people the knowledge of salvation. Through the forgiveness of their sins. Because of the tender mercy of our God by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the path of peace. And the child grew and became strong in spirit and he lived in the wilderness until he appeared publicly to Israel. May God bless the reading of his word. I just, when I read those words, I always think for a minute there that it's talking about Jesus. It sounds like it's talking about Jesus, but it's not. He's still talking about John. What I'd like to do for a few minutes is to give you the modern English translation of what we just read. And it would be on something like this. This was the greatest moment of Zechariah's life. There he stood inside the holy place of the temple. And before him was the golden seven-branch lampstand. To his left was the great candlestick. And on his right, the table of showbread. 
And just beyond that was the veil of the Holy of Holies itself, where in a few moments he would enter and burn a pinch of incense. Zechariah had rehearsed this moment hundreds of times. How it would feel. What he would do. What prayers he would say. He was in his 60s when his name was finally drawn. So there he stood reciting prayers he had waited a lifetime to offer. And Zechariah had a lot on his mind. Many matters to lift to God in prayer. First, there was the feeling of hopelessness among his people. Since the days of kings David and Solomon, Israel had been in decline. The current king, Herod, was really a joke, a tyrant who abused his people while groveling before Rome. Oh yes, the Jews dimly remembered a promise tucked away somewhere in Scripture about one who would come to be king of kings. But prayers so long unanswered were often now unsaid. The sense of longing for a king who would never come was echoed by Zechariah's personal tragedy. The longing for a baby that never arrived. His wife Elizabeth was barren. And childlessness was understood in ancient Israel to be a disgrace and a curse. A punishment for sin. So mingled with his prayers for his people were Zechariah's prayer for Zechariah. He was deep in prayer when suddenly with a great flash of light, an angel appeared before the altar. An angel in the holy place. Instinctively, he threw up his hands to shield his face and he actually turned to run. And the angel cried out, Fear not, Zechariah, and dropped a bombshell on him. Your wife, as Elizabeth, is going to have a son. A son? Did, did you say a son? Yes, Zechariah. Elizabeth will bear you a son. And the angel proceeded to launch into a poem extolling the virtues of Zechariah's son. He would be a national hero, the pride of his nation. Not the Messiah, but a prophet on a par with Elijah himself. One who would turn the people's hearts back to God. And yes, he would prepare the way and blaze a highway for the coming Messiah. <laughs> Can't you just imagine Gabriel delivering a message he has been waiting thousands of years to deliver? Only Zechariah wouldn't believe it. Yeah, right. He replied skeptically, How can I believe what you say? After all, I'm an old man, and my wife is well along in years also. Have you ever noticed that the best news is always the hardest to believe? If you open your mailbox this week and come across an envelope that says, you just won the billion dollar lottery. You know, life teaches us early on that if something seems too good to be true, it probably is. What would you do with that letter that said you were a winner? Well, it would be nice to think that the proper response would be to run down the street screaming at the top of your lungs and weeping for joy. But what do you do with those letters? I just toss them in the recyclable bin. Some people read the gospel the way we read the message on the outside of those envelopes. <laughs> they're, quite to, they're very quick to respond, yeah, right. And can we blame them? Our central Christmas story 
is this fabulous tale about a God who came to earth and was born as a helpless infant in order to woo and win our hearts. And out of love for us, he grew up and died so that we might spend eternity with him. Now you tell me, does that, does that, doesn't that sound good, too good to be true? My friends, listen, I'm here to deliver some news that may jolt you. Gabriel has landed. The angel of God, mighty and terrible, is here among us today. He is here to raise our expectations higher than they've ever been before. And if you choose to disbelieve him, he may tell you what he said to Zechariah. Believe me, it's an awful thing to tell a preacher to be silent. <laughs> Zechariah was struck with laryngitis. And it didn't last a week. It didn't last a month. It lasted nine months. The angel tells Zechariah, because you did not believe, you will be unable to speak until the baby is born. Zechariah, I am rendering you speechless so that you may at last hear what God is saying to you. This morning, let us be silent enough to hear what God is saying to us. And let us try to understand what God was saying to Zechariah. First, God was saying to Zechariah, my timing is perfect. <laughs> Don't question my timing. It's perfect. As the angel says in verse 20, my, more, my words will come true at the proper time. Now, if man is capable of designing all these ingenious systems to bring thousands of events and people together with precision timing, just to make a car or a computer or a spacecraft. Well, imagine what God can do in preparing his visit to earth. That's what I think of at Christmas. The number of things God brought together at one time in one place are just so incredible that it makes all of our efforts pale in comparison. Zechariah was one piece in God's big plan. And let me tell you. So are you. You are one piece in God's plan. And the price is this. You have to give up control. And let God guide the events. <laughs> you sometimes feel like life is a movie. And you arrived about 20 minutes late. And nothing around you makes any sense at all. Well, my friends, all I can say is get used to it. That's the way it works. We're Christians, and our faith teaches us that a terrible, bloody crucifixion turned out to be the high watermark of love on this planet. The key to God's plan for the ages. After that, what could ever probably make sense what we have to do is entrust our entire being to the care of a loving god and live in the faith that he knows what he's doing even when he leaves us in the dark without a clue sometimes the dark can be scary sometimes frustrating we want to protest against events that seem arbitrary and unfair. From our limited perspective, life can seem to be very confusing. But God sees the whole picture. He says, Zechariah, this is what I have in store for your son. And now you see why I've laid, waited so long. My timing is perfect. The second thing God was communicating to Zechariah was the opportunity to get his sense of expectation back. By being forced to listen in silence to God over those nine months, <laughs> Zechariah was able to renew his hopeful spirit. 
Human beings cannot live without hope. And we need two kinds, inside hope and outside hope. And the promise of both kinds of hope can be found in God's Word. Our inside hope is the confident expectation within us that keeps us going. The Bible says this type of hope is a gift of the Holy Spirit. But our inside hope will die unless it is pinned to an outside reality. And by definition, the reality you hope for is a future reality. As Paul says in Romans 8, 24, who hopes for what he already has? If you have it, hope isn't necessary. Zechariah pins his inner longings to the outward promise of the coming of the Messiah. And by the end of Luke chapter 1, this formerly dejected man whose hopes were once as low as his shoe tops, is sitting on cloud nine with his toes dangling in stardust, singing his own song of expectation, the song of Zechariah. I'm not going to read the whole passage, but in Luke 179 it says, The rising sun will come to us from heaven to shine on those living in darkness, and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the path of peace. That's Zechariah. Friends, let me tell you something. You and I can pin our hopes to the same high place that Zechariah did. On the power of God to fulfill his promises and bring in his kingdom. A kingdom that will turn this world into the place God intended at its creation where the graves will open and we get our friends back, and you and I will at last look in the mirror and see the very people that we were created to be. Our interior longing is pinned to an exterior promise, and so as Paul says in Romans 5, 4, hope does not disappoint us. You may ask, what evidence do we have that the kingdom will come? Thank you for asking that. Our evidence is the very reason we celebrate Christmas. We know the kingdom will come because our king has already come. One day Jesus will reign as king and lord over this earth in the kingdom of God. We don't see the kingdom, but we can see the king. In our mind's eye, Jesus is our hope. Let me tell you a little story. In a suburban community in America, there was a growing church. It was always full of activity and a lot of noise. <laughs> Lots of people and blaring music and traffic and teenagers and mission trips. There was a group of people in the neighborhood that didn't like it. They lived in the neighborhood surrounding the church. So they put together a petition which would require the church to shut up, to keep quiet. And they went door to door gathering signatures. And they knocked on the door of a Jewish man and asked him to sign their petition. And the Jewish man said, what's the problem? And they told him, these Christians over here are very noisy. And the Jewish man said, I won't sign that. And they asked him, why not? You're Jewish. You don't even believe in Jesus. And he said, I know. But... If I believed what those Christians believe, that the Messiah has come, I'd be a lot noisier than they are. <laughs> My friends, listen, whatever your struggle this morning, whatever your disappointment, I want you to be quiet for a moment and long enough for my words to sink in. I have news so good that if it isn't true, 
it will break our hearts. But if it is true, nothing we dreamed of or hoped for is beyond our grasp. God came to earth as a human infant. And today we know his heart is a heart of love. And we have his word that just around the corner, a whole new world awaits us where Jesus is king. Now, is that too good to be true? Or could it be too good not to be true? Let's pray. Lord, make us bold enough to believe your wondrous good news this morning. Help us to forget all of our defense mechanisms, our fear of disappointed expectations, and our skeptical questions. And let us pin our inside hopes on your outside promises of a future in which your son, Jesus Christ, is King of Kings in our world. Help us to be silent and to give control to you and to trust your timing in our lives. Lord, as we sit here in your temple, surprise us with a Gabriel. Let there be wonders and miracles the likes of which we've never seen. And let our hearts be bold enough to respond to your good news with songs of joy and praise. We ask these things with hearts full of hope and expectation. In the name of your precious Son, as we await his coming. Amen. As we close our service today, we're going to sing another carol, O Little Town of Bethlehem. And I invite you today, if you have decisions to make or you want to publicly confess your faith in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Come forward. I'll be glad to pray with you as we sing. Stand. Oh, little town of Bethlehem, how still we see thee lie. Above thy deep and dreamless sleep, the silent storm Hope you have a great week this week, first week of Advent, and we look forward to seeing you next Sunday. And uh, next Sunday will be the Sunday of Peace. The second Sunday in Advent is the Sunday of Peace, so we'll be focusing our attention on that. God bless you. You have a great week. Join with me in our benediction, our Advent benediction. Let us go forth and begin the journey of Advent. Begin our preparations. Start the planning, look to the future, but in all we're doing, keep focused on the great gift, Jesus of Nazareth, the Christ child of Bethlehem.
And all of God's people said, Amen. God bless you.